Okay, thank you and welcome everybody. And I'm now just checking here to see uh, for my timings. Okay, but that will uh, see there nine seven. That's uh, it's seven past nine now. Eh? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So first of all, thanks for inviting me here uh, to give this uh, this keynote, this talk. As uh, as Erki already said, I've been here several times. Um, last time was around ten years ago, and at, at that moment, I was really uh, doing, or we were really doing a lot of research, and we've been talking about that already a couple of uh, minutes ago. Uh, in moving objects, and I'm still here. Do you see my pointer quite well? Yeah, okay. In moving objects, and I'm still uh, doing a lot of research in moving objects, if I have to say. In one word, what I'm doing, then I say moving objects. Although, but that's two words. Although, if I now have to say what I'm doing, I'm, I might tend to more and more say also not one word, but two words, GeoAI and GenAI. And you might see it is flipping uh, around here. Uh, because we are really uh, doing a lot in, in that domain uh, nowadays. Oops, sorry, nowadays. Um, but it's all linked to GI science um, and the AI in which we are working, and I will come back to that later on, um, is both a combination of, let's say, traditional knowledge representation, spatial reasoning, in which I used to do my PhD years ago together with that. Uh, work together then with Tony Cohn, who some of you might know from the RCC calculus. Um, but now more and more, of course, also linking this to data-driven AI neural networks, trying to combine this into hybrid uh, AI. Um, and this is actually also the core of the research center that we um, kicked off a couple of weeks ago. And I'll be talking uh, about that at the end of my slides uh, uh, very shortly. So we'd be very happy to further discuss these things um, with you. So I'm from Ghent University. Um, and as I said, Ghent is, uh, and Belgium is a bit like Tartu and Estonia. Uh, for us, a city or a big city is 200,000 inhabitants in China. They even don't call that a city, but that's another uh, interesting thing for people working in mobility. Um, I will be talking today about a generative AI and um, so the basic concepts and I will be yeah, discussing some current developments and then I will uh, try to further explore some scenarios that might be interesting for human mobility research. So not too much about um, uh, yeah, really the, the link to your human mobility research. I will go a bit on that, uh, to that later on. But I think and hope it could be a good uh, basis for uh, what we will be talking about it further on today. So 10 years ago, I talked about Bluetooth tracking. It, that was really, at that moment, a hot topic, let's say, to try to track people that are uh, walking around. It, now I'm talking about Gen AI, and uh, I think that's also a very uh, hot topic. Um, and I think I'm quite convinced that it's here to stay, and I think even much longer than uh, Bluetooth tracking. It's always very difficult. The, uh, the question was asked, how long will you be speaking? Uh, or how many slides do you have? And I said 72. And I said, but that's not a problem because I calculate two slides per minute. And probably Erki is now getting quite nervous because he knows that I'm already talking much longer than half a minute. But I will uh, speed up. And um, you see, one of the most difficult things for me is that I have to make a selection out of, at this moment, 392 slides all about Gen AI, Geo AI linking, uh, going more in depth, being more broad and so on. So I try to make kind of selection out of that and also uh, further focus that specific on the audience uh, that we have here. And I always typically start uh, with AI. What is AI? AI, uh, as I don't know how specialized you are, um, but AI is artificial intelligence. It's um, you can, you can dis discuss a very long uh, time about that, but how I see it is very simple. Artificial intelligence is if a machine does something that we as humans call uh, or see as being intelligent. And that's a very interesting de uh, definition because we as humans and specialists even don't know what intelligence actually is. So we don't know what AI is as well. But we have a kind of a feeling what AI is. 
a calculator used to be many, many years ago AI. Now we are laughing with that. Gen AI is now AI, and in 50 years they will be laughing with that. But that's what AI is. It's, it's let's say, the new, the new thing in uh, trying to, to be as smart as a human, or perhaps in the future being smarter between brackets, but what's being smart. So that's to me AI. So it's not Gen AI only, it's much more than that. I will be focusing more here, as in the press they do nowadays, on Gen AI. Um, and what is Gen AI? This is not Gen AI. This is a small village in Iraq. Is it Iran? Sorry, sorry. Is it? Where? Ah, okay. Yeah, Iran. Uh, so, oh, sorry. In Iran, sorry. Do you know this, this or? Uh, do you know it or not? Ah, okay. Oh no, no. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was wrong. Yeah. This is Gen AI, the perfect creative sparring partner against the fear of the white page. That's to me Gen AI. And of course, if you talk about Gen AI, then the question is, what is Gen AI? Eh, you'll talk later about that. And who uses it? And that's why I said a minute ago. Yeah, we will see who, uh, or are we specialized in AI? Who knows a lot of AI? Question is, who knows a lot about Gen AI? Or who has been working already with Gen AI a lot? And I'm always interested to see and, and, and hear about that. And I used, this slide used to be only about ChatGPT. I asked, okay, who uses ChatGPT? But now I, I, I'm trying to go a bit further and say, okay, there's, oh, there's ChatGPT, but there's, of course, uh, Le Chamistral, Cloud, Gemini, Lama, Microsoft, Copilot, uh, which uses ChatGPT, and so on. And here uh, we have diff different versions of ChatGPT. And I used to ask who pays the, uh, who uses the non-paid version, who uses the paid version, because there used to be a significant difference between non-paid 3.5 and paid 4. And most people only used 3.5. But nowadays, I really don't have to make that difference that much anymore because from now, from a couple of weeks ago, we have GPT-4.0 Omni and everybody can use that. Of course, there might be some restrictions, but uh, please make sure to use that because everything that I will be talking about today or most of these things can be done in 4.0, but not in 3.5. But just as a starter, it's, please stand up and... Yeah, sorry, that's my question. Uh, those at Swamp And please, keep, <coughs> please uh, keep standing until you do not fulfill any more to uh, the restrictions. So, who uses or has used uh, one of these? It doesn't matter which one. They are all good. Dream brackets. So you can discuss about that. Who uses? Who used these things once or already once or twice? At least once or twice. If not, please sit down. Who uses it monthly? Who uses it weekly? If not, sit down. Okay, it's interesting. Who uses it daily? Okay. And uh, for who is it the major tool, uh, say like comparable with, I don't know, Excel, Word, uh, SPSS or some other tools that you use? Okay, so that's always, we have a couple of freaks. Mostly it's, there's somebody of our research group that is a freak. Um, yeah, thanks. You can also sit down now. Okay, it's, uh, it's interesting to see here that many of you uh, uh, are, or at least have already quite some experience with that. That's interesting because very often, and I, I've been talking uh, to many people, uh, people sit down quite, quite soon. Um, so that, that's good, good uh, to know here, and then I can dig a little bit uh, deeper. Um, what is generative AI? It's generative artificial intelligence, so it generates text, started with generating text. As a, a side effect, it was also possible to create code. They even didn't know that that was possible, but they saw that. But it's also possible with some other AI models, but it's also called generative because it generates. Also possible to create images, speech, music, uh, video, but also then more going to geo AI, 3D models, maps, synthetic data, scenario simulations. This is also AI generating something, not text, but 
for example, scenarios or simulations. That's very interesting and important. Um, certainly, if you link it to text, to the uh, current state of the art in generative AI, the large language models, um, I think a very important thing is that we have a paradigm shift. We as humans, it, most of you, have experience in working with computers. And for us, it might be more difficult than for our children or future children to work with Gen AI. Because we are experienced, uh, um, we are used to talk to a computer not as we talk to a human. We try to think if we do a Google uh, search, oh, what should be interesting keywords that are in it? How should I formulate them? Not really with an SQL query or so, but in a kind of query that it might understand. In Gen AI, you don't have to do that. It's even better not to do it. Just talk to Gen AI as you talk to your friend. Can discuss about that. I will not go in depth on that here. Um, but uh, at least uh, certainly as you talk to your colleagues, to your boss, to your PhD students, um, and so on. And I think that's a very important uh, paradigm shift. And uh, a very, uh, I'm always, the future does not belong to Gen AI. Of course, it's not all Gen AI. But uh, I'm quite convinced that many people with me uh, that it will uh, belong to those that can work with Gen AI. So please uh, embrace it. We, we have to embrace it, I think. It's, of course, not a good news show. Not everything is uh, perfect in Gen AI. It's extremely disruptive. Uh, and I would be very happy to discuss with the, about these things with you uh, during the day today. And you see many uh, safety paperclip scenarios. Some of you might have heard about that existential risks, copyright issues. So there are many, many issues with Gen AI. Um, these are very important. I certain, uh, certainly agree, totally agree. But I also think that, well, you can focus, and this is, of course, AGI, uh, uh, general intelligence, uh, that we will, we as humans uh, will, will, uh, will be um, run over by AGI. Happy to discuss about these things. I think if we need to, to remember one thing about all these things, and that's uh, what I really want to emphasize now on, and then I really want to show what the possibilities are. If you have to emphasize and remember one thing, I think it's this one. I think it's the same as we did had to do with the computer, with internet, with smartphone, Google Gen AI. We have to be literate. We need to have AI literacy, Gen AI literacy, and we have to be critical and act responsible. You, uh, we are the human in the loop. So quite often at the end, if I get questions, it's questions about the previous slide, and I totally understand that, and I'm happy to uh, discuss that further. Very often my answer to that question is, happy to discuss that further more in detail, but the very short answer is, we have to be critical and act responsible. Um, and I think that's, of course, very, very important. But now let's go to uh, some more very basic technical stuff about Gen AI, the basis of the foundational models, the huge models that we have now, which are now multi-model in many different modes, um, as we saw already. But it started, let's say, it all started with large language models with text. And it started with a lot of text. So it is data-driven AI. It, the, the, it's... it's um, it's a tool in which you train data. And now let's train some text. Let, let's uh, train ourselves. So we are playing at the computer AI. So say that we have one sentence. I love eating pizza with my friends. Then you might give a prompt to a Gen AI, uh, like ChatGPT system, and you might say they are eating. If you have that one, sentence, if this is the only input that we have, then based on this first sentence, you will have to say, or the system will say, they are eating what? Pizza, because pizza follows after eating and 100% of the time. Say that we have a second sentence. Second sentence is, he hates eating sushi in the morning. If we then again give a prompt, then the prompt says, let's go eating. And then uh, the question is, what will now my trained systems, system trained with two sentences, what will my trained system now say? It will say 50% pizza or 50% sushi. 
this is a, a stochastic parrot, uh, they might say. Others say, no, there emerges at a higher level something. You can discuss about that. Um, this here is also the reason why it is difficult, I would say impossible, to catch students using Gen AI for plagiarism. Because no Gen AI, no two different Gen AI texts that are created are the same. Or, of course, there is a possibility, but it's a quite low possibility, also depending on some settings. Although, as you might see later on, things converge to, uh, to the correct, again, between brackets, uh, answer. And then, uh, training, uh, they were eating pizza, sentence three. Then again, a prompt, when are we eating? We have two times eating pizza, one time eating sushi, so in two out of three, the answer will be eating pizza, and in one out of three, the answer is eating sushi. And this is, if you understand this, then you understand how large language models are trained. Then you understand so-called transformers. Because transformers are just a tool or mechanism to predict the next word based on the previous one. And it's much more than that. Again, very happy to talk and discuss about that. And uh, I will come back to that very briefly later on. Um, but this is what large language model does. It generates uh, based on transformers and it is pre-trained. We train three sentences, but of course it's not three sentences, but it's a lot, a lot of text, whole Wikipedia, the whole internet, let's say. So it is GPT, and this is where a chat GPT is standing for. And on top of that, there's also a lot of human feedback that is uh, used, but I will not go on deep depth on that here. This is the basis for complex language tasks. And everybody, in a way, uh, was surprised that this works so good. Um, and it, is, it reminds me a little bit of what you see here. And I've been talking about emergence. Uh, some of you might know what that is. It's like interactions or things that are at the lower level here, like ants that are moving around. They have a very simple, very simple rules in agent-based modeling. You give them these simple rules, and then they create a kind of a street between the nest and their foot. And that creation of the street, that's emergence at a higher level. And people are now discussing, okay, isn't th is this also what is happening in these language models? Do we give some, yeah, train it on some basic stuff, and is there something emerging at higher level that, that we have a lot of difficulties really to, to grasp? We have a lot of diffic difficulties to grasp this, eh? because it's so much data, it's so much calculations, it is a black box eh, between brackets. But of course, people are trying it also to dig into these things, and they call it then mechanistic interoperability. But I will not focus on that uh, further. These agents, multi-agent systems, eh, many of you might know them eh, by uh, also applying that to human mobility uh, research. Um, in the Gen AI world, this is also a hot topic people are talking about, agents. And it might be a little bit different, but in a way, it's kind of the same. And you might call it, uh, they give it here the name is Simulacra, but it's like a, um, a digital twin in a way. It's a digital twin of the world and how in the world here, for example, persons are interacting, not only moving, but also discussing with each other. And the discussions can be, might be based on large language models. And then this uh, going around discussing with each other including mobility might, I think, very interesting possibilities also for human mobility uh, research. And if you would be happy to, to create a paper with, which is kind, uh, uh, which is cited already more than 3,000 times, I think it's not bad, uh, or this paper that you saw here, that you see here about these generat generative agents to, from uh, 23, and it's already cited almost 1,000 times. So you see, this is really something uh, from Stanford, which, which, which I think will, will be in the future very interesting. But this is really advanced. Let's go back to very basic thing and let's run through some very basic things. First of all, what do we ask to ChatGPT? And I will always say ChatGPT to make uh, the story a bit uh, easier. Um, 
write a very short rap text from a geographer who really enjoys his job. And then you can, you get this output. And then you might say, is this everything that ChatGPT or GenAI can do? And I say, if you, if you think this is the only thing it can do, then it's, yeah, you see it as a kind of um, yeah, calculator that, uh, as a computer that only can do calculations. It can do much more. If you stop here and you say, oh, I have no creativity, I don't know what to do, then you are not creative. If you want to work very well with Gen AI, you need to be creative. So those that are saying, yo, based on, on Gen AI, you will lose creativity, I think it's just the opposite. But what do we do then with Gen AI? We can rewrite, summarize, too long didn't read. If you have long text, too long didn't read, and then give the text, it will compress everything. You can brainstorm, you can also answer uh, to fake questions, and so on. And you can also do these things, and I will run through these things uh, very, very briefly. Translate, you might say, oh, that's so trivial. Why is he now showing this? Because always, if I say this, there is somebody saying, yeah, but I can do better. I can do better than Deepal. Who knows Deepal? I think uh, a lot of people, everybody, or uh, many people, or ChatGPT or something else, Google trans uh, Translate. There's always somebody saying, I can do better. And then my answer is just, and I think that's with all these Gen AI things, if you can do better, congratulations. Then you are really very good in translating. But many people, certainly, for example, those that are non-native English speakers, can't do better and are really very happy to be able to use this. And then there's always somebody saying, yeah, but it makes there and there a mistake. I find that mistake and I understand that. But I don't try to find a mistake, I try to find what is good. That's another way, uh, let's say uh, the, the glass is half full. Uh, but do you see here, this is a, a nice visualization of me. Um, we're going from left to right. We are going from narrow AI to artificial general intelligence. Narrow AI is it's already good in text, in images, in code, and so on. And we try to combine everything to AGI. And we are at this moment here for text. We are from here going to there now for images and here to there for code. And what I'm now interested in is to see what is possible here and here and here and not what is possible is not possible there, there and there. Because this will be possible in the future. Of course, it's important to know what is not possible but really don't keep saying for one year it's impossible to use references in, in uh, Gen AI because it hallucinates references and they are not correct. It hallucinates, of course, uh, you will know what that is because you are using it. But the references in some tools are correct nowadays. I will come back to that later on. I don't like, I, I'm a researcher because I like to do research, and, but I don't like to write. But I like to meta write. And what is meta writing? It's just saying, write a short, very simple text of around 75 words, saying that Gen AI is interesting, it has issues, and that you as a scientist have to be responsible for the final decision. And that's what we call Gen AI literacy. This is a text that I can say here, but if I have to write it down in a specific journal or I don't know what, it's not really good enough. Then I just can meta write, just drop this down and say, Please uh, write this at a good text. Uh, can you write a, a very short text? And then it gives this, and it says, Gen AI offers exciting advancements in science, providing innovative tools for research and so on. And this is a good text. If I now get this text of master students, PhD students, researchers, I just say, please drop it in ChatGPT so that I can read this, because this is what I'm interested to read in. Then, of course, you might say, yeah, but this is not really my style. I'm not really writing like that. That's not my personal style. If that's not, then try to write in your personal style, but just very fast. And then just say clean, clean text. And then you get this text here. The though it was wrong, it's, it should be you, large language models, until, until, this here three dots should be better a point and the question instead of question and so on. So what you do is here, from a very uh, basic uh, example here, but you go from a specific text written 
okay, but, but with some, some, some mistakes, let's say, and you just say clean it and you have a better text. And this will not be changed that much, so it will be in your own style. And I really like this. Um, and those that say, yeah, but you, you cannot do that, you have to be able to do it from here to there, then I say, why, if we want to do data cleaning of numbers, everybody says, yeah, you try to automize it, because that speeds up things, that's good. Why don't we do it with text? And I say, yeah, but that's text. But then I say, yeah, but text in large language models is quantitative data. It's points, each word or token is a point in a high dimensional space. It's a vector in a high dimensional space, so it's also kind of calculating. And then you start getting a very interesting discussion. And that's why I do research, because I like to discuss. I also like a little bit to code, but I'm not really good in coding. So I think that I'm, as, as think many of us, one of the persons that really have, have a lot of yeah, uh, added value in using uh, tools like ChatGPT. Here I ask it to ChatGPT, can you uh, program the Dijkstra algorithm? And it starts programming it. This is just uh, doing on the fly. Some of you know that and say, yeah, of course, that's trivial. Those that do not know it, please use it, check it. And of course, you can say, yeah, but is it always perfect? No. Are you always perfect if you program? Also not. If you, have, you are the human in the loop. Uh, but here I uh, quite fast implemented um, the Dijkstra algorithm that everybody knows. You can also analyze. And this here is um, a post of mine, but this one is a, is a famous guy in, in, in this world, uh, Ethan Mollick. Um, and he said, well, I just asked uh, to the new uh, ChatGPT 4.0 this question. Analyze this, visualize it, do sophisticated analysis, including statistical analysis, and tell me what it means. What? This zip file, and I think, I'm not sure anymore, it was a CSV. Push on the button, and it starts doing this. Yeah, it's two CSVs. And now again, you can discuss, is it all perfect? No. But is it interesting to do this and then check what is perfect, then check how you can go further based on this? I think so. And if this is the output of a student, he, will, he or she will pass uh, the examination or maybe even a master thesis. And if you say, yeah, but I will see it because they will be, they will be writing with difficult words, no, they will not. If they can work well with it, they will say, make sure not to write it with too difficult words. And if you say, well, I will ask uh, some questions at the, at the defense, and you will see they will be impossible, they will not be able to answer the questions, I will say, if he or she can use it very well, they will be able to answer, because they will ask to ChatGPT, please generate me 20 questions and give me good answers so I can study them or read them to get inside. And then by the end, people say, yeah, but that may be good because they get inside. And then I say, yeah, okay. But you said five minutes ago that it's not good to use ChatGPT. And that's, uh, it's not black and white. I think it's a great discussion and that's, um, yeah, I, li I like that. I also like this, of course, these three nice pe persons, uh, images of uh, these ones. Everybody has seen these things. We can elaborate on that, I will no not do that here. Uh, but I think it's getting more and more interesting if you, um, Try to combine, uh, go multimodal, try to combine text with images. This here is a schema, a visualization of a CNN, a convolutional neural network, uh, AI, uh, where we go from, um, from input to output. And you can just ask the system now, can you explain in layman terms, because I don't, I'm not really specialized, or my introduction of my master thesis or my paper has to be not too difficult. Can you explain this in layman terms and link to the figure? So these numbers that you see here, these things, you have to put them in the explanation as well. Push on the button and you get this. It, this shows how a convolutional neural network processes an image to understand and classify different parts of it. Starting from left, original uh, image, uh, that's the input of the CNN, then we have multiple layers, um, and this is then responsible for, for the understanding, and we have layers with values 96, this value, and so on. 
and even uh, we see uh, details that you see uh, here at the uh, right side. This is where we are now. And again here, you can discuss, are students allowed to do this? Don't they have to think for themselves to write that down? I don't know, you can discuss. Do they have to put half a day in trying to write this as good as possible? Or do they have to create this and then try to go further based on that? And double check, of course, with, well, uh, with good references. Going uh, more to uh, geo, geo stuff, you might ask a question, can we use GIS already uh, within Gen AI? And then uh, what, what, do we see? what do we see here? Here we see um, shape files, and I'm just asking, uh, can you visualize this? And I'm now just, I will be running in, in a couple of minutes through a whole chain. So we see shape files. Um, I will ask, can you visualize it? It starts it typically uh, working. It calculates, you can see that if you want to, and then it visualizes this. And then I might, might ask the question, but I only want Belgium and France. Again, it starts working. It might say, yeah, I have issues in finding the column where you find name, but I will suggest this, is that okay? And, 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 and runs again. And then it creates uh, only France and uh, Belgium. And then I say, yeah, okay, I want only France, Belgium and the cities, and I want to save it. Again, uh, lots of uh, stuff here. And then by the end, it will save here. Uh, these two shape files. So this is what we can currently do with uh, GIS in, uh, well, with GIS data in Python. Um, sorry, using Python in ChatGPT. Um, then you can go further and you might say, um, visualize this, okay, visualizing it. And then you might say, put a buffer around each city and then it creates buffers around the city. So it is already using some GIS tools. But these buffers are not circles, these are ellipses. Then the question is, why are these ellipses? I ask it to the system and it gives an answer. Is this perfect this answer? You can discuss about that, but you aren't human in the loop. You have to check whether it's correct or not. And then you can ask, okay, um, can I analyze these results? It's, oops, it's, sorry, it starts analyzing these things. Then you might say, yeah, I need an exercise for my students. Can you create an exercise based on that? And here we have this exercise. And then you might say, yeah, but it's actually interesting for an examination uh, uh, exercise. Can you create examination exercises and also uh, create the answers? And then it says, okay, for buffer zones, I have this question and this is a standard solution. And then you might say, oh, that's interesting. Let's create a master topic out of that. Can you give master topics? Oh, no. And then we have here many master topics. And then you pick out one and you might say, yeah, this is interesting to create um, a project proposal. Create me a project proposal. And then you might ask, give references. And then there is somebody who heard one year ago at the news, oh, the references are wrong. And that was correct that, at that moment. This evolves very fast. At this moment, it's not correct anymore. In ChatGPT, you can discuss, but if you really want to use good references, then use perplexity. Who knows perplexity? Few people, please check it, use it. Say it to students, because this is really, I think, very, very uh, interesting and important. What is this perplexity? If you say, can you find references for the following text? Can you put the references in line in this text and put below the references list, the reference list in an APA style? And this is my text. Then it starts searching here through many sources. It creates in line the references and it gives in the APA style, between brackets, the reference list. But um, even more important, it gives links here to the original papers. So you can go to the papers. And I think, I mean, this is what, how we eh, say to our students, if you do literature research, of course, there's the traditional ways, but also please use perplexity because it will speed up your research and you will be able to dig much deeper into stuff. 
Digging deeper into stuff can also be interesting by um, discussing. Can be interesting by um, discussing uh, orally with the app. I don't know who has used that. Yeah, our freak. Um, you can talk with your app and you can say, yeah, why is that interesting? Well, it is or it might be interesting, for example, to ask, and this is also what you have to do if you work with ChatGPT, thinking aloud. I think most of you will know the thinking aloud methods is if you, if you do some, something that you ask um, it to people, think aloud, say aloud what you are thinking. What you are thinking, then this is how you have to work with ChatGPT. Do not think and say it's not good in doing things. Just type that down and you're thinking, you, you don't think, but uh, you write that down. But in thinking aloud, if you ask to people in a method think aloud, try to store it using this, this tool. If you ask questionnaires, try, try it to use this here, this tool, because it will store things quite well. If you want to prepare for job interviews, project defenses, presentations, just ask it to this tool. Just say, I will have to present uh, a project and I will get nasty questions. Here is my project. These are the people that will ask questions. That's their specialty. These are uh, the, the things that they will uh, score on. Can you give me questions? And I will um, try to answer them. And can you then later on give me good answer, uh, get, say me whether or not my answers to these questions were um, okay. And it will start doing that. You can also, it can also see, what do you see here? Well, I see a, a, a garden scene um, in twilight and, and something uh, further on. You can ask, can you uh, present in, in 3D? Can you um, present things linked to spatial reasoning? And then we see highlighted here all these things. I will not go in detail, but for me that's interesting because I used it to um, work with RCC, the Region Connection Calculus. Uh, some of you might know that. Um, and in that calculus, you try to get a relations between different polygons. And it also understands these things. And we now try to go further into this by not going to, uh, oops, oh, what's that? By not going to uh, polygons that are standing still, but going to uh, movements, as you see here, cars that are moving. But that's another story um, that we will um, uh, go further. This is already a bit more uh, advanced uh, stuff. Now, um, uh, let me see the time because I'm running. Okay, yeah, that, that's, but uh, I, will, I will make sure to, to skip some stuff. Um, so natural language, uh, GIS, I think this is uh, one next, uh, next thing, one next uh, important and, and interesting thing. What is that? We can talk to ChatGPT already by saying, um, get, write me this, write me that. We can use GIS because we are used to work with GIS. I think it is important and interesting in the future that we would be able to ask questions such as that. Last week, there was a lot of rain in my neighborhood. If it continues to rain this much next week, which fields near me will then flood? Nowadays, it is impossible to ask in natural language such questions to a GIS. We have a lot of data, but we cannot ask that yet because we need assistance in GIS. And we are, we, but also people like Esri. They will create, are currently creating generative AI assistance. And they, and, and here you see an example of such a generative AI assistant where here, ChatGPT wise, you can ask questions and here you get input. And this is a, let's say, very interesting things that we have now uh, ahead of us. So I'm, I think this it will be uh, very interesting towards the future. Um, let me skip this one. And I think the future, and, and I will compress this into five minutes. Um, I will think uh, the future in uh, human mobility and, um, and Gen AI will be very broad. 
And the question is, who has the answer? I can try to give an answer, I can search in references, but I can also ask it to ChatGPT. And I asked it to ChatGPT, and it gave me many things as an answer. And I asked it not only to ChatGPT 4.0, but I asked it, and I will skip this, you know, I, will I will ask it to many systems that I set in the beginning, GPT 4.0, Gemini, GPT 4, Claude, E, Chinese colleagues, Llama open source, Mistral at place 18, that's our European uh, large language model. And what I saw is that for some reasons, you might say it's normal, it converges to many, many answers that have a kind of good overall view. And this is uh, what it gives. And without going too much in detail, um, it's talking about urban planning, a more long term uh, uh, presented. It's talking about traffic management, uh, simulating traffic flows, simulating transport uh, schedules. It's talking about personalized mobility solutions. And it's talking about, let's say, all the rest. And also emergency stuff. And this, this is, um, let's say, an overview of what it's talking about. And, but I will not do that because I will not have time. Um, and I tried it to run through these things and give examples not of what I find in literature, but of what we uh, are, have been doing. Um, and I will not uh, dig into these things uh, here because I extended a bit uh, too much uh, in the beginning. Um, but for those that might be interested to further discuss it, please uh, discuss that uh, further with me. Um, we have an, um, yeah, a, a visualization tool, but, but I will, uh, I will, I will uh, run through these things. Uh, just maybe one thing to say here. Where are we? Here, where is Enrique? Ah, because I said to Enrique in the beginning, I will be talking about. This here is one project proposal that we are, have been working on quite hard. And it's actually very often what we are doing now. It's trying to improve large language models um, and to go to a, next, uh, to a next phase. To import reasoning into these models to, um, uh, to extend them to multi-modality, and then, uh, uh, where is it here? Reasoning, multi-modality, and then it uh, to apply it to really concrete applications, as we see here, navigation services. And if you want to know more about this, please ask uh, Henrique, because he is, of course, specialized in the case that we will be working on. It is a case in um, Helsinki, where things that the specialists in large language models and in reasoning, like Tony Cohn, um, they will give us input in order that we are able to really ask very specific, personalized and interesting questions to help improving the navigation on small scale and broader scale in a city such as Helsinki. And we will see what is possible with these large language uh, models. We've been doing research about uh, um, bike safety. I will not dig into detail uh, on that. Um, and uh, to finish up, this one. I can go for, I, I've been talking about this for maybe years. That's maybe a bit uh, too extreme. But this is what I did for my PhD 20, 20 and some years ago. And this is symbolic knowledge-based AI. What is this? This is about moving objects. So remember, I started with saying moving objects. If these are two objects, two points, they are moving to each other. This one is moving towards that one. This one is moving towards that one. Moving towards another one is represented by a minus. Moving away from is represented by a plus. So this two moving objects to each other is minus minus relation. This one moving away is a plus plus relation. This way I can create many relations, short relations or longer relations, and I cannot combine two objects, but many objects. And if I can do that based on the knowledge that I have, I can finally create a visualization, a representation of an overtake event. 
and I can confront dangerous and non-dangerous overtake events with each other. And I can do micro-traffic analysis. And this is what we have been doing already a long time. And what we would like to extend even it together with tools that we have now at, in our research uh, group. And uh, by the end, for us, if it's moving objects, cars, that's interesting. But to be honest, it can be anything for us. It might be tennis players as well. And these tennis players or these cars can be represented using that calculus that I talked about. But this calculus is a sequence of one visual representation, timestamp 0, timestamp 1, timestamp 2, timestamp 3. This is a sequence of representations and not a sequence of words. But I started by saying, what does a transformation, uh, a transformer, it says player hits the, and in 86% of the time, it says ball after that. Now we say, Interaction at that moment, interaction at that moment, interaction at that moment through a neural network, and we will get that output. And if you want to know more about this combination of data-driven research and our um, symbolic AI, then you have to talk to Jana because she is working on that nowadays. And I would also be very happy to discuss this because we think that here, there's many interesting possibilities. And I will skip this one. And who are we? This uh, uh, is what we are. We are uh, in, at Ghent University, but we also tried to, to set up our research center at UGent. Um, and it's not only at UGent, we try to get it very broad. And we feel that there is a momentum for Gen AI or a more by extension to Geo AI. We had our kickoff event, many people were interested. Um, and we would like to go further combining knowledge-based and data-driven AI to hybrid models to analyze geospatial information and together, for example, with people like you it, to combine this with mobility uh, research. I'm not really specialized in mobility research, but I have experience in doing that, but would be very happy to discuss these things further um, during the day um, with you or in the next six minutes. And to finish up, two important and famous guys. I don't know who knows these people. This is, shout, Bill Gates. And this is Sam Altman. Okay, two important people. They were talking to each other a couple of months ago already, and they talked about the future. And to Sam Altman, the future is multimodality. I think I talked a lot about that. It's reasoning, reasoning ability, which is important. I also talked about that here. And it's personalization. I showed the very fast the personalized possibilities uh, that we are trying to work on. And it's also reliability. Hallucinations can happen. It can give wrong information. It sometimes gives wrong information. But out of 10,000 answers, there is always several or many very good answers. Now, the question is, how can we get this information that is really very good? How can we make these systems reliable? And for that, we have a lot of tools that I use nowadays. Maybe the most famous one is Rack nowadays, a retrieval augmented uh, generation. But I will not be talking about uh, that. We will see in the future, I think it's uncertain. But uh, Gen AI and also Geo AI, let's hope, it is here to stay, um, I think. Okay, so not a good news show. Uh, I really want to say it is disruptive. There are many issues, but I also think it's important to see that there are uh, opportunities and possibilities and the, that we have to try to embrace it uh, in research. Thank you. Do we have, we still have three minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Nico, for this uh, optimistic introduction into the uh, AI topic. Uh, we will uh, hear more uh, throughout the day, but uh, we have uh, like two question possibilities. So, of course, uh, here, uh, Yuka, please. Hey, uh, yeah. Thank you, Nico. Fantastic presentation, and uh, enjoyed it very much. Um, 
I had thrown in the concept of trust into all of this AI. So you have used it a lot. How much do you trust the information you get? Trust is about, it's already, uh, the question is what do you, do you mean with trusted? It can be at several levels. On the one hand, for example, well, yes. do you trust what they are doing with? But I think you, you say, okay, do you trust the results that you get out yes. of that? You have thrown in the human loop, I think you called it, or human. Uh, yeah, human in the loop. Yeah. Well, I, I, I always, I'm always human in the loop, of course, but, and, and you can, that's always the, the starting point. People that are using ChatGPT 3.5, they always say to me, yeah, but it makes lots of mistakes. And then I ask, what do you use? They say 3.5. I say, sorry, please use 4 and now certainly 4.0. And then let's discuss again. Because personally, I don't think it may, uh, it doesn't make a lot of mistakes, but you have to use it for correct things. And that's, for example, one first thing. If you want to know how many citizens or many people live here, in Tartu, don't ask it to that system. Ask it to uh, a web, to Wikipedia, for example, because it will be correct. And you know, Wikipedia years ago, also many people said it's not good. It will be correct and it will not use as much power electricity. So I think also very important here is you have to be AI literate. And that also means that you have to know when you have to use it. And I can't, and then people say, yeah, when do I have to use it? In order to know that you have to use it. You have to be, I mean, we are researchers, so we have to get used to that and get a kind of the feeling, okay, here it works and there it doesn't work. It's like reading papers, say, yeah, what, what do you have to get out of a paper? It's, it's a difficult uh, question, but um, it's not always perfect, but, and certainly when it starts doing calculations and so on, you have to check it, of course, but you have, you can vary in research very often you can use things that you as a human can at the end also give a kind of score and say, okay, I will use it or not. Um, and let me say now one thing. I, I, I still, I think I still have to find the first top AI paper in web of science that has no mistake. Um, and I, yeah, okay. I will stop there. Do we have uh, more questions? But maybe taking from here, uh, uh, because uh, yesterday uh, Jukka was uh, talking about uh, the problem of, uh, and this uh, complicated word, irreproducibility. So the problem with uh, all these uh, AI models is that you get different results uh, when you rerun uh, the code. Uh, because it changes uh, some parameters, you will never get the same thing. But in the research, uh, it needs to be kind of producible, uh, reproducible. So what do you think of uh, this issue that... Uh... It's just depending on one's, one value. It's the temperature. Yes. You can play with the temperature between zero and one, I'm not sure. But how these tools are now set, indeed, they, the idea is that they are not too um, oh, this, um, too creative, but also not too traditional. So they have to give a kind of different answers, but you can force them to always give the same answer. And then, then it will always take if, in that uh, transformer uh, thing, it will always take the highest score. It will, I will not say that's always the perfect answer then, but it will always be the same answer. So this, this is this way you can avoid that, but then you will not get, you might not get very interesting answers, but that um, irreproducibility uh, also there, that's indeed very, that's true. But on the other hand, it's also interesting because you can create different, let's say entities of some specific question, and then you can stochastically analyze them. But that's a very, yeah. very, very uh, good, good point, of course. You have to, you have to be aware of that. Um, and then on the other hand, as I said, uh, our RAG, uh, Retrieve Augmented Generation, people are, people are really doing, in, in the AI world, people are really trying to really get insights also in the black box, eh, because I know it's a black box. I personally don't think it's a black box. I think it's a too complicated box. What do I mean with it? You know the weights. It's not black. It's not that you don't know the weights. We, for us, it's just too compl complicated to get insight in the weights. 
but people are trying to get insight in that, and that's called mechanistic interoperability. Mm -hmm. But that is where the top mathematicians are now doing work. And again, I'm not saying it's only good, eh? it's not a positive story. I know there are issues, certainly, but I think we have to see what the possibilities are. True. So our time is up. Uh, thank you so much, Nico. Uh, round of applause. Thank you, Nico, from all thank of you. us. This is, uh, this is again a book of maps, like yesterday, but uh, this time it is an outcome of a 30-day map challenge. A book of a 30 maps not created by generating. I thought you would say it's created by Gen AI. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh